Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks and welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now, today's video is very close to my heart. It's about uh, being shot at dawn executions in the British and Allied forces during World War I. You see this, this subject, shot at dawn, it's close to my heart because I was in the British Army uh, Royal Military Police uh, and I had uh, nine and a half very good years in that regiment. However, when I was in training, we were taken into our regimental museum to show the proud history of our regiment. Uh, except that in one corner we were stopped and we were shown uh, a hangman's rope, hangman's noose. And this hangman's noose had been used to execute the last British soldier uh, execution and I asked the question I says you know why do we need to see this you know why you know so much detail and uh, the sergeant who was taking us round he actually says well the reason being is that one day as a military policeman you may be called upon to execute somebody all of a sudden I oh my goodness me I might have to execute somebody now first of all if you're a British soldier or Commonwealth soldier uh, First World War, the Great War, and you're fighting away, um, and you are suddenly charged or accused of being a coward, yeah, or deserting your post, casting away your arms, all these different things that you can be executed for. You're not just then told, right, you're guilty, you're dead. You are put on trial. Now, if it was in peacetime, you would have a general court-martial, and it will be in a proper courtroom, and you will have proper representation, um, and also you will have a judge advocate who can oversee the whole thing to make sure the proceedings are legal and fair. On the First World War, yeah, it all goes to pot. You have a new thing called, well, I think it's a new thing, the Field General Court Martial. So you are accused, you left your post, you deserted, you ran away. Uh, the court is held by your battalion, not even by your regiment, by the battalion, right? Uh, no longer do you have to have colonels and generals involved. It can be a major or even a captain if a major's not uh, available. The proceedings will take place in nothing more than a bedroom in a local hotel. So the bench, as it were, might be in front of a bed. You, as the accused, are allowed what's called the prisoner's friend. It's a young officer, a junior officer, who is there to represent you. Now, first of all, remember this. This is well over 100 years ago. Many of those soldiers were not articulate. They, many of them were not that, uh, shall we say, bright or um, educated. And there they are against a bench, three at least. Officers, educated, university, this is the ruling classes. You're going to be intimidated. The other thing is, very often the courts resented the fact that you had the right to a prisoner's friend who could give evidence on your behalf. They hated this and sometimes refused to acknowledge it. This is not right because it was a man's life that was at stake. Now, being shot at dawn, traditionally the time to shoot them, it's by firing squad. Firing squad. They weren't military policemen. They were men from your own regiment. This is the rifle, the short magazine, the Enfield rifle. Ten rounds in there. So there was no particular number. You could have six men, 12 men. They form up. And you know, many times before executions, the men, they just didn't want to be part of it. It's understandable. They're going to be shooting one of their own men. But when they form up on parade, normally in a secluded garden with a wall behind it and a post fitted in the ground, they would lay their arms and then they would leave. And their presiding officers would then actually load the rifles. One bullet or one blank. The soldiers would come back, fall in, pick up their rifles. And while they're waiting there, the accused will be brought in, tied to the post, blindfolded, and the sentence read out. His battalion will be parading either just outside so they can see it, or very close nearby. Present arms, 
take aim, fire. I cannot imagine having to do it, but I've actually spoken to a First World War veteran and I asked him about what he thought about the executions. And he shook his head. You could see it was a raw subject. And then he looked me in the eyes and he says, Kevin, at the end of the day, how on earth do you think they kept us in the trenches? But I've got a couple of cases here, well, in fact, three, that I, I just want to bring to your attention. Um, it's distressing. It is so sad. But hey, it's history. The first case I want to share with you uh, was a double execution at the beginning of 1915. Um, it was Joseph Byers and Andrew Evans of the Royal Scots Fusiliers. What makes this so bad is these soldiers didn't desert from the front line. They didn't cast their rifles away and run away or anything like that. They weren't in the trenches. They failed to turn up for parade prior to leaving for the trenches. Evans was an old soldier, a reservist who'd been brought back into the ranks, right? Uh, they'd been in a lot of action, but Byers, he'd had two weeks rudimentary training before, before being sent to the front. And he was only 17. That makes him underage for military service. Now, when these guys were captured and sent back to their unit, they were put on trial. Now, can you imagine the 17 year old, scared to death, young Joseph there? He's in front of a row of his peers, his betters, yeah? And the poor guy pleads guilty to desertion. Officers actually wrote down, I don't think he understands. Well, they're gonna be executed. But the battalion knew what was going on. These guys are only gonna be shot, for example, and they didn't wanna do it. So the day of the execution, 6th of February, 1915, the guys are tied to the post side by side. The firing squad is led in, the battalion is paraded to witness this. The command is given, they open fire. Young Joseph isn't killed. So instead of an officer coming up and shooting Joseph through the head, they get the firing squad to reload and fire again. But they can't kill him. They can't, just can't. These guys, their hearts must have been breaking apart. On the final volley, Joseph is finished off. There is a cop out here. And this, as an ex-military policeman, this really gets to me. Is they said, well, he'd signed the Articles of War. He had signed up, so he must accept the military regulations, the punishment. But surely there should have been some officer somewhere up the line who said, hang on, this lad's only 17. He's only had two weeks training. Or was it just the fact that uh, they were shot for the sake of example? So the second case we're going to look at is another double execution. Albert Ingham and Alfred Longshaw, both of the 18th uh, Service Battalion, the Manchester Regiment. First of all, these were good soldiers and they fought all the way through the Battle of the Somme. And it was uh, Alfred Longshaw who had a problem at home. His wife was seriously ill. Now, Albert and Alfred were so close. They had worked together, they'd grown up together. They were inseparable. So Alfred has put him for leave. You know, look, my wife is possibly critically ill. He was denied leave. Now, the two of them decide they're gonna try and get home. Alfred needs to see his wife. So they abscond. They are caught on an American ship in Rouen and they're handed over to the British and they're put up for court-martial. The whole thing goes through, and it's the beginning of December 1916. They're shot, side by side, and buried side by side, shot at dawn. But then their officers lie. They don't tell the people back home that these guys have been executed for desertion. They lie. And this wasn't the first case I've looked at, that they just try to register them 
as died of gunshot wounds, died of wounds. Now, George Ingham, the father of Albert, he's lost his son. And after the war, he still believing his son died of his wounds, finds out through the Commonwealth War Graves Commission that Albert was shot for cowardice, for desertion. George Ingham is so heartbroken. He was asked by the Commonwealth War Grave, do you want an inscription on his stone, on his headstone? And this is what George did. Shot at dawn, one of the first to enlist a worthy son of his father. You can visit that grave. You can visit many of them. But I'm going to go on to the third one now. So this is the third case I'm going to cover. Uh, James Crozier, a young lad from Belfast. He was executed on 27th of February 1916. I've known about this case for many, many years. But what woke me up to do this particular session of Shot at Dawn was young James. Because my wife has recently had a DNA tested, you know, for the ancestry kind of thing. And in people she didn't know she was related to is the name Crozier. And straight away, wow, you know, I wonder if she's related to James Crozier from Belfast. Well, the story, it's, it's just heartbreaking. He was 16 when he enlisted and his mother is begging him not to go. Outside the recruiting station, there they are, Royal Irish Rifles, but the commanding officer is there. He needs troops. Frank Crozier, later Lieutenant Colonel Crozier. And he says to young James's mother, don't worry, I'll take care of your lad. I'll look after him. Now, what he should have said was, no, he's too young, he's 16. But no, he took him. And young James fights, and he does well. But he is one of the victims caught in a mine explosion where the trench underneath them explodes, yeah, as the Germans have burrowed underneath, and he's buried alive. He recovers, but obviously he's going to be shook up. I mean, I've been in very close to explosions, and it really does shake up your entire system. And this young lad is in the front line in the dead of winter, and he wanders to the first aid station. He says, a grenade's just gone off. You know, and I really, I mean, shock and all that, but the medical officer signs him off. You're fit for duty. So he goes back. Now, from what I can gather, he didn't cast away his arms. He didn't throw off all his kit and run away. This is a guy who, bang, doesn't quite know where he is, goes back. So, Lieutenant Colonel Crozier has him put on trial. And I will tell you, le reading as much as I have done into this case, it was engineered. They're going to shoot him. It doesn't matter if he's guilty or not. They're going to execute him. Now, during the trial, medical evidence was missing. Good representation was missing. That's against the fundamentals of our laws. And when the report was sent up, big lines put through it. He's going to be shot, not because he's guilty, but for the sake of example. The battalion was close to mutiny over this. The colonel has made sure that young James is so drunk, and don't forget he's actually underage, yeah, to even be in the army. He is so drunk he can't stand up. Now, in one of the stories I read years ago was they sat him in a chair and, pie, and tied the chair to the post. But in the official report from Lieutenant Colonel Crozier was they had hooks on the post. So they hooked the semi-conscious James Crozier to the post, and then tied him, blindfolded him. If you're going to be executed, if you look at all of the ways you're going to execute somebody, they've got to be awake. They've got to be able to understand, listen to the charges read out. Then the firing squad is... Brought to order, present arms, fire. They didn't kill him. Now, Lieutenant Crozier had threatened the young subaltern the night before that he'd got to do a good job. One of the rumours is that he threatened him that if he didn't shoot young James through the head, if he had to, he'd be put on a charge for cowardice. 
Can you imagine being that subaltern, that junior officer, as he walks up to the post and there is this blooded young James? Well, there's a little twist. Apparently he uttered his last words. Mother, please. Mother, make it stop. Then the young officer blew his brains out. It's incredible to think that uh, throughout the First World War we had 346 British and uh, Commonwealth soldiers executed. 346. 309 have been pardoned since. Those are the ones who were executed for desertion, cowardice, that kind of thing. 37 of them weren't pardoned because they were convicted of murder. But there's another interesting fact that I've picked up. Only 10% of death sentences were carried out. Another interesting point is Australia refused to allow any of their men to be executed. Good on your Australia. So we British have a memorial to those shot at dawn. It's at the National Memorial at the Arboretum in Oriwas in Staffordshire, not far from where I actually come from. Now, I know this topic, it's incredibly sad, and I hope, I hope you appreciate where I'm coming from, and I hope you found it interesting. So, back to normality. If you found it interesting, thumbs up. If you're a subscriber, hey, thanks a million, yeah? If you're not a subscriber, ding that bell, because I'll tell you that there's lots of films, lots of different subjects, all coming down the line, because I'm loving this, and I'm looking forward to the comments on this particular subject. So, thanks very much. Bye for now.